Hey guys, welcome back to the WashU Nephrology Renal Pass series. Uh, this is the May episode of 2017. Uh, trying a new um, format. This time I'm going to do a CPC style as I am uh, unaccompanied, unfortunately, by Dr. Gott or a fellow. Hopefully they'll be back soon once we find some time to record. So I'm going to record a, a CPC case um, and I would encourage for you viewers watching at home to pause at certain points. Uh, and try to formulate a differential in your mind. Uh, think about what further testing you'd see. And I'll give you a little bit of time to get, get a chance to interpret the kidney histology on your own before we jump into the explanation. So that, feel free to pause at any time. I think there, your learning will be enhanced by doing so. Before we get started, I wanna do a quick shout out to uh, ukidney.com. If you guys haven't heard about this great online resource, please go check that out. It has a lot of excellent nephrology related videos, presentations, a really excellent nephrology article bank for some of the most salient um, uh, and seminal articles that are have been published with uh, PubMed links and visual abstracts. So please check this out. It's a good resource. Um, so the way we do CPC here at WashU is you're usually given a one-liner to formulate your differential. So the one-liner for this case would be 56-year-old Caucasian female with hyperthyroidism. She presents with two weeks of shortness of breath and microscopic hematuria. So I come up with a, a rough differential. Obviously, I don't know the diagnosis based on this, but in my head, when I hear this, um, there are a couple important things that pop out of me. Obviously, the shortness of breath and the microscopic hematuria make me think of some kind of pulmonary renal syndrome. Uh, and the hyperthyroidism might be um, salient or it may not be. Um, the age of this patient and the gender of this, or age and race and gender of this patient are important. Um, someone who's a little bit older, I'm thinking less about diseases like lupus, uh, more about diseases that affect patients of this age group. So diseases like multiple myeloma are more common in uh, people who are in this age group than younger. Um, and diseases like vasculitis and anti-GBM disease um, are higher in, in the older population as well. Um, the, the race, Caucasian, is also uh, a clue. There are certain diseases that uh, are very unusual in um, certain races. For example, IgA nephropathy is very uncommon in African Americans. Um, but that's kind of how I'm thinking and how I usually approach the one-liner to the case. Let's get some more information here. She um, presents with two weeks of shortness of breath she initially went to an outside hospital with these complaints. At that time, she had a chest x-ray, which revealed some right lower lobe consolidation. She was treated with azithromycin without significant improvement. She was also quite anemic at that time, a hemoglobin of 7.2. The hemolytic and iron workup there was negative. Ultimately was discharged home, but she presented to our hospital two weeks later with no improvement in symptoms and ongoing fatigue. Bit more history here, medications she, or medical history, she has osteoarthritis and hyperthyroidism for which she takes methimazole, five milligrams a day, calcium, 500 milligrams BID and Ultram as needed. So pretty limited medications, to be honest, uh, just the anti-hyperthyroid medication. Family history, she has uh, lung cancer in both parents, her social history, uh, she lives with a significant other, other and a daughter. She drinks alcohol socially, but uh, not a heavy smoker, uh, social tobacco use. She does not use illicit drugs and she's actively working as a physical therapist uh, in a healthcare system. Her review systems is significant for not only the shortness of breath, but also fatigue, migratory joint pain, and hands or sydneys. So with this further information, there are some systemic complaints, which are quite interesting. The migratory joint pain, uh, the hyperthyroidism, the medication she on, um, and so forth. On exam, her vitals are stable. Um, pertinent exam findings are uh, bolded here. She has decreased breast sounds in the right mid lung field, one plus low extremity edema. Uh, her joint exam is pretty normal. Uh, no focal areas of tenderness, erythema. She has pretty normal range of motion. She has no skin rashes or lesions or uh, so forth. Here's her blood work on arrival. Her uh, sodium is slightly low at 132, potassium 3.5. Her BUN is 11, creatinine 0 0.9. Uh, her protein is 6.5, her albumin is 2.3. Her urinalysis shows 2 plus protein, large blood, and 50 RBCs. Hemoglobin remains low at 8.1 with an MCV of 87. White counting platelets are within normal limits. Her 
thyroid testing is normal and she has a 24 hour urine collection of 702 milligrams per day. Initial x-ray showing a right lower or right middle lobe consolidation. She has a CAT scan. This is a representative slice showing similar findings. She undergoes bronchoscopy. Um, there is no visualization of pulmonary hemorrhage. Right lower lobe transbronchial biopsy was performed. It actually revealed hemosiderosis and focal alveolar hemorrhage and fibrin. Cytology was negative for malignancy. Cultures are negative for bacteria, fungus, and TB. So I think here's a good opportunity for the viewers to think if you were a nephrologist now getting involved as a consultation, what would you want to order next? Uh, so give that some thought. Pause the video if you need to. I'll show you what was done. She had uh, the following blood work done. An ANA, which was negative, rheumatoid factor, which was 46, anti-GBM antibody negative, hepatitis HIV testing was negative, peripheral smear showed no schistocytes, no evidence of hemolysis. She had a very elevated ANCA, the titer of 1 to 2560 with a PR3 antibody of 186. Again, that's very high. So with that, we performed a kidney biopsy. I think this is another good opportunity to pause and think, what do we expect to see on kidney biopsy? Obviously, um, we have a positive ANCA. We have some pulmonary symptoms. We have microscopic hematuria with preserved renal function. And so try to think in your head, what do you expect to see on this kidney biopsy? So we'll give you a second to take a look at this yourself. Again, pause if you have to. Try to um, note what stain this is and what abnormalities you see, if any. So this is a trichrome stain. Um, she uh, has a good sample, so it's obviously kidney. That's good. Um, I think the only thing that I would really comment on at this um, power because low power, you can't really comment on the glomeruli, so you do see red cell casts within the urine, and those are uh, pretty evident throughout the entire sample. Again, pause if you need to. Um, look at how this differs from the previous one. So this is an H&E stain. Again, nice sample. You see plenty of glomeruli. Let's see if I can point them out here with a pointer. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six glomeruli in the sample. And the glomeruli don't look totally normal. You can see this glomerulus doesn't look normal. There's some something going on here too. We'll get a higher power at that. Again, what you can see here is the red blood cells, uh, the red blood cell cast within the tubular lumen. Um, pretty preserved interstitium and tubules. Uh, not a lot of atrophy, not a lot of fibrosis. Again, that's a good sign. Okay, so this is one sample glomerulus. Again, an H and E stain. So it's pretty high power. You can see that this portion of the glomerulus looks relatively preserved. And what we have here is uh, multiple cell layers thick of something on the outside of the glomerulus, outside of the capillary loop, uh, in Bowman space. So this is um, the beginnings of a cellular crescent. And I wish Joe were here, but I believe you know this pink staining here is some fibrinoid necrosis. Um, again, look at this stain. How does it differ from the previous one? This is a PAS stain. You can see the PAS positive tubular epithelium here. The tubules brush border lights up on the PAS, so this is different than the H&E. And here we have a glomerulus. Again, the right half, pretty normal, okay, not a lot of um, nothing like endocapillary proliferation or mesangial expansion, but we have this large area within Bowman space, which is a cellular crescent. That's inflammatory cells within Bowman space. Now, 
Not all glomeruli showed that. Here's another glomerulus from the exact same kidney biopsy, also a PAS stain. Now again, you can see the tubular epithelium, you can see the um, Bowman's capsule and the tubular epithelium light up nicely with the PAS. This glomerulus looks pretty normal. Open loops, healthy mesangium, no crescents, no fibrinoid necrosis. So, so what we have is a focal, uh, focal, focal areas of crescents. Here is, hopefully you can pick out this stain, it's very distinctive, and this is not normal by any means, so this is a silver stain, or a Jones. You can see the Jones stain highlights black the uh, capillary loops in the basement membrane, it stains the collagen in the basement membrane. So again, this looks normal, obviously there's a large portion of this glomerulus which is abnormal, and so this is again what a crescent would look like on a silver stain, you actually have rupture. I think this is such a cool picture. You can actually see this normally would be a capillary loop, but this is actually broken open and ruptured. It spilled the blood space into the urine space and that has led to an inflammatory response where you have cellular proliferation of the epithelium uh, leading to the cellular crescent. Beautiful picture. Now, we have fibrin staining on immunofluorescence. And remember, this patient had a positive ANCA. So in ANCA disease, when you see findings like this on light microscopy, that's what you expect is, you know, um, crescent segmental necrotizing lesions, carrier exits, and so forth. What differentiates ANCA from other diseases uh, like NIGBM disease, or lupus, or post-infectious, or IgA nephropathy, is the absence of immune complex staining on immunofluorescence. So here we have fibrin, so this stains positive for fibrin in those areas where we saw crescents, but the remainder of the immunofluorescence, IgG, IgA, IgM, C3, C4, were negative, indicating this is posse immune. Here's an electron microscope low power of a sample of the capillary loop. In this glomerulus, it looks pretty healthy. Again, let's orient ourselves. So here we have a mesangial space. Here's the capillary loop in the basement membrane. This area is subendothelial. This area is subepithelial. So this is the blood space or the capillary loop. This is the urine space or Bowman space. Um, and you can see there's no electron dense deposits here that I can visualize. There might be some areas of foot process effacement. Um, that's not a specific finding for minimal change disease, but there is, I believe, some foot process effacement here, but no electron dense deposits. Again, indicating that this is a posse immune process. So, what would your final diagnosis be based on the information I've given you in this case? Give you a few seconds to think about it. Again, pause if you want to. And I'll give you the diagnosis that this actually was deemed to be clinically, which is methimazole induced ANCA vasculitis. So uh, the anti-hyperthyroid uh, uh, medications are associated with an ANCA vasculitis, methimazole, and propylthiouracil. Um, in addition to other drugs, we've, all, we've talked about hydralazine a lot in the past. Um, there are several drugs that can be associated with this. So here's a, a quick review. There's a nice article in C. Jason from 2015. I've uh, given you the citation there if you want to look it up. That talks about drug-induced glomerular disease. And you can see here that ANCA-associated vasculitis is associated with not only the antihyperthyroid medicines, PTU and methimazole, but hydralazine, penicillamine, Allopurinol, sulfasalazine, and levamisole, which is not really a prescription drug, but has been used uh, more recently as a contaminant in uh, cutting cocaine. Other um, glomerular diseases, such as drug-induced lupus, also can be seen in hydralazine, uh, are seen in the anti-TNF-alpha drugs, penicillamine and procainamide, membranous nephropathy, gold, penicillamine, captopril, and NSAIDs. This is not a comprehensive list by any means. Um, but it just kind of shows a quick overview of it. So 
quick word on antithyroid medication induced ANCA associated vasculitis was actually first described in the early 90s. Uh, the prevalence of ANCA antibodies in patients being treated was really first explored in about 2000, and most of them had a P ANCA and an anti MPO antibody like our patient had. Um, it was associated with longer mean drug exposure and discontinuation of the drug in and of itself led to disappearance of the ANCA in about half of the patients, although that was a small study. Um, in a large, uh, I believe, case control series, they looked at hyperthyroidism that was associated with the antithyroid medications and it was associated with an 11 times higher odds of developing a positive ANCA serology versus a control. So I think this is a nice case. It's not all that common using the antihyperthyroid medications, um, but we certainly see this quite a bit with hydralazine, and it's always good to keep in the back of your head. So I hope that was an interesting case for you guys, show, highlighting some of the um, pathology that we see in these type of disease. Uh, again, my name's Timothy Yao. I'm an assistant professor in WashU. If you have suggestions for further cases, uh, more things you'd like to see renal path, more educational materials either targeted for the med student, resident, renal fellow, or the attending, please let me know. Email me at yautt at wusel.edu or tweet me at maximal underscore change. Follow our YouTube channel at Wash U Nephrology. Uh, be sure to check out Kidney, as I mentioned in that uh, second slide. Thank you again so much for watching and hope to see you guys uh, next month for our regularly scheduled web episode. Bye.